just find some way to appreciate being here together. Maybe by waving or looking around. Just remembering that you're in a community. Just a quick reminder that if you want to come early for some social time, drop in anytime after seven, between 7 and 7.30, and um, it's just a time for folks to chat. So if you'd like to do that, it'll happen every week. So working our way through listening to the heart still. We're moving on to chapter six. I think this is chapter six. And this is another chapter written by Tanisra called The Grit That Becomes a Pearl. And she starts off this chapter with um, a quote by Mark Nepo. Having loved enough and lost enough, I am no longer searching, just opening, no longer trying to make sense of pain, but being a soft and sturdy home in which real things can land. These are the irritations that rub to a pearl. And then some of Tanisra's words. We create space and allow awareness to provide a gentle holding for the irritations that rub to a pearl. This work of Vipassana, or insight meditation, mindfulness meditation, this is the work of, of, of Vipassana. As we, in, let me just start over, how about that? We create space and allow awareness to provide a gentle holding for the irritations that rub to a pearl. This is the work of Vipassana. As we inquire into the moment, dukkha becomes dharma, or nature, rather than a me that is wrong or bad. As we listen more deeply to suffering, we begin to notice non-suffering. The heart realize, realizes its innate courage, strength, and invincibility. This journey through pain and suffering burns away the impurities, and what is revealed is something pristine, clear, and beautiful like a moonlit pearl, the tender, merciful heart, and its infinite ability to receive the cries of the world. The tender, merciful heart, and its infinite ability to receive the cries of the world. And then from Shinzen Young, the ultimate expression of meditation comes when we can feel all the pains of the world, experience them with mindfulness and equanimity so they dissolve into energy and then recolor that energy and radiate it out as unconditional love, moment by moment, through every pore of our being. Just appreciating these three different and beautiful ways to describe our practice, what we do here together individually and collectively as we build a community of practitioners who are interested in exploring the territory of the heart. And this exploration naturally includes pain. And there's no avoiding that. This is one of the central teachings of the Buddha, that we will, as human beings, at many points in our life, feel pain, emotional pain, physical pain. And so this 
practice is really about this exploration with suffering and understanding that there's a difference between pain and suffering. And so with a lot of curiosity and love, we learn to get interested, understand, so that we can understand what leads to suffering. Like how is suffering created? And this is a really deep exploration, very nuanced and tender, and and at times feels paradoxical. To understand, we can have this idea sometimes just taking a look out at the world and going, oh yeah, I understand something about the way suffering is created. And it's not to deny any of that reality, the reality that we see and feel and live in and among. But with this practice, we're interested in the mind's relationship to experience, this heart's relationship to experience so that we feel that difference between pain and suffering. Pain or unpleasant experience and suffering, or we might just say resistance. So we're actually interested in transforming our relationship to suffering, getting close so that we can understand and see how suffering is created. And through this sophisticated approach, we learn something about freedom. And I would say it's a sophisticated approach because there are some simpler, less sophisticated approaches and our hearts know these very well, such as blame or denial or distraction. These are the heart's ways of coping with difficulty, coping with pain, and seeking happiness. Yet this more sophisticated approach of getting close to, of connecting with, of being intimate in our lives, all the way through our lives, can seem like Uh, somewhat, again, I mean, they use the word paradoxical because it's actually sensitizing this heart to all of life and doing this kind of training, training the nervous system or training the heart to be in the middle of our lives. So developing some equanimity And so we don't want to, and I've said this many times, and I'll continue to say it, we don't want to somehow reject or demonize this heart that takes the quicker, shorter route to happiness. We want to understand that, like, oh, yeah, this heart wants to blame because it doesn't know how to connect with the pain of this moment. This heart will lash out with anger and violence because it doesn't know how to be here with this complicated mess that we call existence, human existence. And so these really natural ways of relating to experience, to relating to life, are just that, really natural, really human. And yet we still want to hold that with, and care for that, reality, and still continue to pave this new route, this more, this stronger, more lasting, more secure route towards happiness. So we're getting, we are building resiliency and courage through all of life, through all of life's challenges, through the breakdown of the body, through the difficulties in our interpersonal relationships, and through reckoning with the collective, all that's moving in the collective.
in these defense mechanisms or superficial roots to happiness are often established on the backs of seeds, the seeds of greed and all forms of ill will, hatred, and all forms of delusion or confusion and ignorance. And different forms of these three poisons, including over this dependency on consuming, craving, appropriation. And as I just name all the flavors of normal yet painful realities of human existence, it might feel like it's a lot to reckon with. And it is. And there's no way to do that actually without love. So this is something else we learn on the path. That in order to meet pain, in order to meet the reality of our lives, the superficial roots to happiness that human beings seek, and the sensitivity that's developed along this path of seeking a different, more sustainable route to happiness, that we have to, the only way forward is to actually care about it all. And that's what I might call love. That every moment of mindfulness arises with a moment of metta, a moment of love, a moment of kindness, a moment of care. It's actually not possible to open to this reality without some love. It's too hard otherwise. The heart just shuts down and says no, and then something else becomes, sounds more favorable. And as I was sitting today and this week with what I might have to say about dukkha, which is what we're talking about, suffering or the unsatisfactoriness of experience, that is relevant to this moment. What, what arises for me often in the course of my practice, but again here, is this deep sense of belonging. So it, it was is has been really through this understanding and intimacy with dukkha or with suffering that this heart has been able to feel into a sense of belonging that has been unmatched in my life. And so what the heck does that mean? Like connecting with suffering and realizing belonging? Doesn't that seem weird? <laughs> yeah, it felt like a weird, a weird connection to make. But there's so many ways to actually feel into that connection. And in, in one way, it's like realizing that, oh, suffering is just a part of this life that we live, all human beings are going to reckon with confusion around pain, like clinging to pleasant experience and trying to push away the unpleasant and realizing that resistance is what causes suffering, that craving for some reliability, right? Not wanting things to be this way, not wanting this heart to be anxious, not wanting the world to be this way. And that resistance or that no to the way things are is, is what we might call suffering. And so in some way, this understanding that oh, all human beings are doing this dance, right, of relating to life, 
of figuring it out, of misunderstanding unpleasant experience and pleasant experience, of misinterpreting pain, thinking it's personal, but not, but forgetting that, oh, you know, the body just falls apart and it's not actually mine. It's, this is a force of nature or like, wow, this, the way that any number of social problems, you know, that we can point to in the world that they, they arose, they have arisen, they continue to arise lawfully throughout history. They've been seed, they continue to be seeded in particular ways. So it's no surprise, even though it might feel like a surprise, it's no surprise actually that this is the way it is. So this understanding like, oh, it's like this, it's just like this. It's not like this because I did something wrong or somehow I didn't do something right. It's just like this for human beings. It's like this for you. It's like this for me. And we might have different flavors of relating, right? Like this heart might get anxious and another heart might do something else. Get angry. I don't know if you've ever explored the Buddhist personality types, but some of, some of us, if it can be a fun way to think about our personalities and how we express who we are in the world. Um, some of us might um, go through the world always looking for what's beautiful and others of us might go through the world always noticing what's wrong and some of us might be in a perpetual state or feel like we're in a perpetual state of confusion about things, right? So when I say some of us might, you know, this mind might be geared towards anxiety and another mind might be geared towards grasping or always seeking something pleasurable. Like that might be two ways of relating in the world, but it's an ex they're both an expression of of trying to fight our way out of this, right? Of trying to find happiness in superficial ways. And so this kind of belonging comes with an understanding that, oh, we're all doing this dance. Look at us all. We're such a mess. And to see the variety of expressions of greed and delusion in the mind and see them shine in others too. Like, oh, look at that. It's not just you, it's me. It's not just me, it's you. Look at us. This is what happens. And through that reckoning with the reality, this heart learns to take a little more care. Like, oh, I don't want to make this worse. I don't want to contribute in ways that aren't going to be useful. This new book called You Belong by Seven A. Selassie, it's wonderful. She begins this book by talking about um, her first cancer diagnosis. And she's had, I think, a few, maybe three. And she's talking about... Um, you know, taking really good care of her body and being a person who does a lot of yoga and eats clean and feels strong and healthy and yet still experiences a lot of emotional turmoil. And then she gets this cancer diagnosis and she's exploring some alternative treatments, including um, coffee enemas. She says this, why is this relevant at the beginning of a book about belonging? Belonging is an expression of life. I would have done anything to belong to the living. And also everything is relevant when we talk about belonging. And then she says, I don't wish cancer on anyone. 
but I wouldn't change a thing about my experience. This doesn't mean it was easy. I wasn't always open to what was happening while it was happening. But the challenges I face, the challenges you face, the challenges we face, collectively at this time, any place in the world, even a colonic room, any challenge in my life, even cancer, are all invitations to belonging. And belonging is our true nature. Belonging is our capacity to feel joy, freedom, and love in any moment. As the late Zen teacher Charlotte Joko Beck said, joy is exactly what's happening minus our opinion of it. So this connection with belonging, it's like a, a radical acceptance of just the way things are even when it's not perfect, especially when it's not perfect, when the heart is resisting, when the heart has opinions, when the heart doesn't like it, and yet can find a way to include that in how we reckon with and relate to life. It's such a beautiful and freeing experience. And it's actually this that led me to think, oh, yeah, it's a sense of belonging. Being with Dukkha has allowed me a sense of belonging that I have really never had. There are so many ways, so many times in my life, moments in my life when I felt like I haven't belonged and someone don't belong because of this. I don't belong in my family because of that. I don't belong with my friends because of this and not good enough or whatever the proliferation is in the mind. But it's this deep sense of like, oh, even this belongs, that really allows the heart to settle. There's no sense, I get to be included completely now, right? Once I learn and begin on this path of connection and intimacy, we just see moment after moment that there's no sense in rejecting anything. It's all a force of nature, everything, every last bit. And this from a book that I've referenced before, Love and Rage. It's the newest book by Lama Rod Owens. He says, in my healing, I am also mourning. Sometimes I am in despair. Mourning and despair are very private matters. It is my acknowledgement that there is suffering. It is my honoring of my discomfort as well as the discomfort of everyone else in the world. So again, like a, a connection with belonging, like, ah, oh, this reckoning with how it is for me, even in my discomfort, even in my pain or grief or mourning, somehow there's a, a capacity to connect with other human beings with, up, with, with more life. And from the same book, a quote by Reverend Angel. In truth, we have to integrate our wounds into our understanding of who we are and what we are really capable of so that we can be whole human beings. Only from there can we begin the process of healing the brokenness, the brokenheartedness within ourselves that is then the foundation for beginning to heal that in our larger society. So integrating, reckoning with, connecting with, not avoiding or denying our wounds, feeling our pain, not pushing away our pain, recognizing that this too is a force of nature. It's not something that has to be denied or transcended even. So dukkha and a connection to belonging. And as you can hopefully hear through the words of the teachers that I just read, it's a tender process. 
of reckoning with suffering, connecting completely and wholly to the way things are. A tender process. I was speaking with a a teenager this afternoon and they were tearful at one point and they were a little embarrassed by the tears but talked through them anyway and we were just there together with it and they said something so profound like sometimes sometimes I think I cry for 24 hours and then in a maybe a, a disclosure a moment of disclosure that they talk to themselves sometimes in these moments and I thought it was such a a wise thing to say, like, oh, yeah, of course you do, right? Sometimes this body needs to move that energy, that pain through. Once this pain is met and seen with love, right, connected with in a real tender and sincere way, like, oh, this hurts, then the body knows how to do something with that. And sometimes the tears will come, or sometimes words might come, and maybe even in our own private space, they'll come forward in surprising ways, like, oh, this just needs to be said. Or perhaps we're fortunate enough to have a good friend that will witness that for us. It's not that we land here or stay here. It's really an act of giving permission, like, oh, this natural process of energy moving through, I'm just going to allow and trust that this body knows how to do it in so many ways. And at this political and social moment in life, it's really important to call on the body to help these energies move. You might find yourself like needing to get up or I don't know why, but I'm just going to get up and wander around my house for a minute or I don't know why, but I'm just feeling myself taking a deep breath right now. And this is the body's way of regulating, letting something go, letting it go, not of this natural process of not holding on. The body's way of discharging the energy of resistance Right here in these moments, we are, the the body knows how to allow. Ah, intimacy, allowing, allowing movement. There is a sutta that I enjoy. It's from the Sutta Napada. This translation by Andy Olinsky called the, Th- the Thorn in Your Heart. And there's something so rich and vulnerable about this description from the Buddha about suffering. So maybe I'll just read it to you. Fear is born from arming oneself. Just see how many people fight. I'll tell you about the dreadful fear that caused me to shake all over. Seeing creatures flopping around like fish in water too shallow, so hostile to one another. Seeing this, I became afraid. This world completely lacks essence. It trembles in all directions. I longed to find myself a place unscathed, but I could not see it. Seeing people locked in conflict, I became completely distraught. But then I discerned here a thorn, hard to see, lodged deep in the heart. It's only when pierced by this thorn that one runs in all directions. So if that thorn is taken out, one does not run, one settles down.
so much here. Just allowing the silence to hold it all. The sensitivity that comes from practice can somehow sometimes feel like a burden. It's so much to feel. We are in more intimate touch with the reality of life and all the ways that human beings suffer and cause suffering for each other. And it can feel almost intolerable in moments like, oh, so much suffering, so much. And there's no getting away from it. There's, it's right here. Like, oh, this human being is causing harm. This human being is feeling pain. Oh, that human being is causing harm. That human being is feeling pain. And one of the things I love about this is the Buddha's acknowledgement of his own fear. It brings us back to this reality that we don't have to be perfect. The Buddha wasn't perfect. The Buddha was full of wisdom and thankfully shared it with other people. But that wisdom was, that wisdom developed right through pain right through suffering. It's how it develops for us too. Right through pain. Right through violence. Maybe just one more thing from Tanisara. That she does such a lovely job. I mean, she and Kitasara are such beautiful storytellers. But, and through this act of telling a story, it really illuminated something for me about how, you know, just the inevitability of reckoning with our own suffering and our hearts, you know, habits that we can see aren't useful yet. These hearts continue to make the same mistakes like blaming and hating and denying and shutting down. And, you know, just kind of what I said in the beginning that, this is just a part of it, that rea- realizing that these superficial means to happiness are totally normal and reasonable, and yet we can accept that and train in this intimate way of being that's more sustainable, and that training includes accepting. So Tanisra says, For example, I suffered when the unethical behavior of someone I trusted came to light. It had a devastating impact. I felt betrayed. The theme of betrayal became a powerful contemplation, particularly as there was no resolution. In the end, the situation taught me a lot. I kept reflecting on where the suffering really was. Was it in the behavior of the other, in the divisiveness that followed, in the blame that was projected, I wanted more truth to come out, but it didn't. It stayed hidden in a web of lies. When lies are covered up, it leaves those abused without recourse to justice. This is a powerful theme that runs through human history. People manipulating others for their own ends, while at the same time distracting from their behavior by shifting blame elsewhere. We'd be naive not to understand that the conversion of lies to truths is pervasive in contemporary political and corporate culture. 
When apprehended correctly, such experiences become the sharpening stones for our wise realism. To have a conscious relationship to suffering is different than having an unconscious one. We will all experience pain simply due due to our incarnation into form. It is part of being human. We experience bodily pains, ill health, fatigue, hunger, thirst, and we get older and we will feel the pains of aging. That's just the way it is. Freedom from dukkha doesn't mean eternal youth or that we are never going to have a headache, never going to feel irritation or loss or get betrayed and hurt by others. Freedom from dukkha is not abdication from the human race, but a deeper acceptance of how we are, an acceptance that brings both equanimity and also a clear response. A deep sense of belonging, right? It all belongs. And that finish on that passage that Freedom from dukkha is not abdication from the human race, but a deeper acceptance of how we are, an acceptance that brings both equanimity and also a clear response. It's with this intimacy that we're practicing, it's with the sensitivity that develops even in moments of pain, unpleasant experience, big emotions, not wanting things to be this way, that this willingness of the heart to be aligned with truth and in in integrity with the truth, that actually feels good. Like, oh. And with that sensitivity, we start to feel into our own power here, that when we are not in alignment with truth, with our own integrity, it doesn't feel good. So we want to act in accordance with that, in accordance with our own values, our own appreciation for life. A a good and wise friend was reminding me um, that to recognize that in others, that when other people are not in alignment with our own integrity, it doesn't feel good to them. And we can have compassion for that, like, oh, because I know how that feels. It doesn't feel good to me. And even if others are willing to play that out, it certainly doesn't feel good to them. And it will be something that they will need to reckon with at some point. Even if reckoning with it in a memory, like, oof, I did that. Oof, I did that. Oof, I did that. That hurts. It doesn't feel good. It's been a day of big emotion for me and relating to the reality of our world and the reality of injustice. I had a good long cry this afternoon and felt the the pain of the reality of hurt and violence and hatred in our our world. And then I looked for a little inspiration again in Lama Rod's book, which is what inspired me to read a little from it tonight. I'm going to end with this passage in hopes that it helps us relate to what's moving 
uh, probably across the country tonight as many people reckon with pain. He says, and never in my life had I ever been told and ever been supported in touching deeply into this woundedness. I call it heartbrokenness. To sink beneath the anger or to move through the anger was to recognize the anger for what it was, an indicator that my heart was broken. When I allowed myself to experience my heartbrokenness, my activism began to change. I wasn't out there in the streets any longer trying to do stuff because I was angry. I was out because I was just really hurt, and I wanted someone to recognize that. I wanted someone to recognize that for the first time, my struggle wasn't to get people free or to disrupt systems. My primary struggle was to embody and communicate that I was not okay, that I was struggling to be happy, and that I wasn't above all being distracted by the anger. I suppose, in other words, my activism was to first give myself permission to be free, to feel deeply into my experience, so I could enter into change work more myself and in deeper attunement to other people's struggle. And we can call that, we can call what we're doing in practice a kind of activism as well. It's activism of radically including all parts of who we are, every identity, every every single element of who we are, so that we deepen into that felt sense of like, oh, this is true in this heart. And as Lama Rod points to, when we can feel that for ourselves, it deeply connects us to each other, makes it harder to act outside of our own integrity when we feel connected. So thanks for your kind attention tonight. There's a little bit of time left. If anyone has comments or questions. And please raise your virtual hand. Silence works for me, too, if that's what's here tonight. Welcome to talk, and welcome not to, if that's what feels good. Thank you for saying that, because as you were talking, something was, something I want to maybe just clarify, that that word resistance, I'll, it might work for me, but it might not work for everybody. And so maybe reactivity is a better word, or that might not even be the right one, but you can try on language to see what works for you because there's definitely a place for resistance, like a movement of resistance of saying no in big ways and small ways and all kinds of ways, publicly in our own homes, with ourselves, setting boundaries or limits, renunciation, just straight like, no, I'm not going to have another piece of chocolate cake tonight. So, so that's not what I'm talking about when I, when I, um, I'm not saying that that's not okay. Definitely honoring that there's a place for that. And also pointing to the value in this kind of radical inclusion or belonging that comes from saying yes fully and deepening into what that means to say yes, like, ah, more and more sensitivity, more connection. If somebody was was somebody about to speak, I saw a few heads like lean forward, just as I said that. (laughs) Okay, well then, Call in my friend Patrice again. 
to send us off into the night. Let's all commit to this beautiful act of sharing the merit, this act of imaginative generosity. And really appreciating our practice together and the benefits that we've derived from it. And in our hearts, we offer gladly, happily, joyfully to share whatever goodness has come of our time together, of our practice, of our belonging with each other, to each other. We offer to share that with our parents, teachers, friends, family, our community, those we know, all those who sort of naturally come to mind, the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the wingeds. But especially tonight, let's share the merit with all those who are are really hurting, who are mourning, who are really feeling that the wheels of justice move unevenly, move slowly, and in fact run over many people. So let's just open our hearts to those who are suffering. And let's really stretch and include all legislators everywhere, all politicians everywhere, all of those who are virtually meeting for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, all those that we might be tempting to tempted to close our hearts down to. I think if we could, if we could, we would share the benefits of this practice with them, with beings known and unknown, in the hope of freedom and love and justice for us all. If you'd like to unmute yourself to say goodbye, you may. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.